Hey everyone, I'm going to discuss multiple topics related to LDO design in this video. We will start with an increasingly popular form of LDO topology. Then I will discuss my preference for the true ground and I will end the video with a discussion on thermal considerations. So let's get going. In previous videos we have looked at LDO's width of ship capacitors and which is conventional topology and LDO without op chip capacitor, essentially Miller compensated LDOs. Both topologies have their advantages and disadvantages. Let's consider the LDOs with op chip capacitors. These topologies have excellent low transient behavior along with good high frequency PSRR. But on the flip side, it's really difficult to stabilize this topology for high load currents. We often require to kill the loop gain or increase the current in the amplifier in order to do that. Killing loop gain means poor load regulation and higher amplifier current means poor current efficiency. On the other hand, Miller compensated LDOs have excellent stability at higher load currents and stability is maintained while maintaining high loop gain and that means excellent overall load regulation. But at the same time, they suffer from poor transient and poor high frequency PSRR. So this begs a question, can we somehow combine best of both worlds? And the answer surprisingly is yes, we can. So let's consider such a chimera. Let's first consider the location of dominant pole. We have two very strong candidates for the dominant pole here. On one hand, we have a microfarad capacitor at the output. But on the other hand, we have Miller multiplied capacitor sitting over here. But recall that the output pole is heavily load dependent, which in fact is the problem. Output pole is at its lowest frequency at low load currents. So we would expect it to dominate at low load currents. And that means at higher load currents, it's Miller capacitance which is dominant. And that means there is a crossover of dominant pole at some intermediate load currents. How about the phase margin? If we plot the phase margin in these topologies with load current, we'll find a U-shaped curve. We'll find decent phase margin at extreme load currents. Phase margin will reach its minima at some intermediate load current. Now it is different from the previous topologies that we considered so far. There we had worse phase margin at one of the extreme load currents. At low load current for Miller compensated LDO and at high load current in conventional external cap LDO. And it also means that in such condition, we only need to ensure good phase margin at one extreme load current. But in this case, we need to be very careful in finding this phase margin minima. We need to run stability analysis at multiple load currents. And the location of minima will change with PVT corners. So we need a very exhaustive verification matrix. And it all means more work. But more work is not only required in simulation, we also need to update the design for this to work. Recall that Miller multiplication depends on the gain across it. And in this case, gain is provided by power PMOS. But as the load current changes, this gain also changes. In fact, if the load current increases, the gain reduces. At the same time, the gain of this single power stage may not be high enough to make this Miller capacitor dominant. In order to fix this problem, typically more gain stages are introduced between the amplifier output and power stage PMOS. At the same time, this gain stage needs to be non-inverting in order to preserve the overall inverting feedback. But since gain stages are typically inverting, we may need to put two gain stages. So let's see how a typical configuration will look like. A typical configuration may look like this. We now have two additional gain stages around the Miller capacitor. You can probably spot the obvious problem. We now have many more poles in the loop, but it is not as bad as it looks. Notice that this stage has diode connected PMOS as load stage. And that means this stage is not a high gain stage. At the same time, this is an adaptive gain stage. It is adaptive because as the load current increases, gate of power PMOS goes low and this causes current in this stage to increase. So even with the high gate capacitance of power PMOS, this will be a high frequency pool. 
better still it is a pole tracking pole so we are left with this pole notice that this is a high gain stage so resistance of this stage will be high but it is driving a relatively small transistor here so with careful design choices this pole can be designed to be outside the unity gain frequency but we may still be struggling to get a good phase margin making miller zero a low tracking zero can help a bit but we may still need some more zeros zero created by esr can help here we can also introduce a zero in the loop by putting a capacitor across this resistor or we can put dedicated resistor and capacitor to create zeros but if you are doing that try to make it a pole tracking zero so you can see that this design is considerably more complicated than either conventional design or miller compensated design but many high performance ldos are being designed using just this configuration you can also add more loops to improve the transient performance or psrr one final note on this topology Some people call this topology any cap stable LDOs. It is because this LDO topology is stable for any amount of output capacitance. Let's now move to next topic, which is where is the ground? Let's look at a typical LDO system again. There is a reference voltage which is probably generated somewhere in the band gap. This reference voltage then travels to the error amplifier of the LDO. the power pmos may be located somewhere else in the chip which then supplies power to the load which may be on chip or off chip then we may have an off chip capacitor in this schematic these little triangle represent a ground and in your simulation this may as well be a zero volt ideal ground but in reality it's not one node you may have one ground pin in your chip or you may have two ground pin one for the analog section and other for the digital load there will be finite resistance and inductance of these tracks then you will have a ground on the board which may actually be a ground plane and this ground plane will eventually connect to a power supply maybe a battery so in this complex network where is your ground you may be tempted to think that probably the negative terminal of the battery is my true ground or is it ground of your band gap reference well there is no unique answer to it and different people may have different choices but here is one way to think about it the primary purpose of ldo is to provide supply to a load so what really matters is what is the voltage across the terminal of this load So in most of the cases it is advantageous to take your load ground as your true ground and measure everything else with respect to this ground Now in reality even this load ground is not one single point but you have narrowed down the choice considerably Putting large amount of decaps across the load will help in further stabilizing this ground Okay now let's move to thermal considerations No power converter is 100% efficient. LDOs are particularly known for their power inefficiencies, especially if there is a large difference between input and output voltages. Most of this loss happens across power MOS. This power loss is converted into the heat, which results in the temperature rise within the chip. We need to ensure that die temperature remains within the chip specifications. There is a very simple but useful equation which converts the power loss into the die temperature increase this relationship is known as thermal ohms law we are all hopefully familiar with the standard ohms law which is v equal to ir there is an equivalent rule where voltage is replaced by temperature difference current is replaced by heat flow or heat transfer and electrical resistance is replaced by thermal resistance here ja stands for junction to ambient what this relationship basically says is there is a linear relationship between the heat dissipation and temperature increase so if heat dissipation is doubled the temperature increment also doubles thermal resistance which is also known as theta ja is a property of chip and the package its unit is degree celsius per watt a high thermal resistance means chip will heat up more easily theta j value can range from 10 to 100 degrees celsius per watt for same package 
bigger the chip gets, smaller the theta j a becomes. Also, some packages like QFN have smaller theta j a as compared to some other packages like CSP. Exposed thermal pads or heat sinks can dramatically increase the thermal performance. Now let's plug in some numbers to get a better understanding. Let's say we are generating a 1.8 volt supply from a battery. Let's assume maximum battery voltage is 5 volt. Let's also assume that maximum load current is 250 milliampere and the load is off chip. Let's also assume that the thermal resistance of this package is 60 degrees Celsius per watt, which is a fairly typical number. Now we can calculate the worst case temperature entries using this equation. The total power dissipation here is voltage across the PMOS multiplied by the maximum load current. And this gives us a total temperature increase of 48 degrees Celsius. This increase is over the ambient temperature. So if the maximum temperature specification is 125 degrees Celsius, then ambient temperature cannot be more than 77 degrees Celsius. We can also calculate the maximum possible load current for a given ambient and junction temperature specifications. So for example, if maximum ambient temperature is 70 degrees and maximum junction temperature is 150 degrees, then we can draw slightly more than 400 milliampere before we start violating our junction temperature spec. So if you are designing a high power LDO, then keep an eye on the thermal performance. And that is all for this video. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.